It's a sunny afternoon in London. We're down a really cute little cobblestone street standing outside a, I don't know, 16th century house, 17th century house. So this is where Handel lived and also amazingly where many centuries later, Jimi Hendrix lived. It's now the Handel and Hendrix Museum. I'm gonna let myself be amazed and I, I kind of decided not to have any expectations. I'm Emma Dabry, author and broadcaster. And I'm Jesse Bernard, a music and culture writer. Welcome to Meet Me at the Museum. I'm really excited to be here. I'm a huge Jimi Hendrix fan. I've been here lots of times before, um, but I haven't been in about a year. So I'm looking forward to, um, yeah, another fix. This is my first time visiting and I'm actually really excited because I've always been a big fan of Jimi Hendrix, um, especially growing up in school. He was like kind of my secret passion because everyone was into grime and, and rap and hip hop. And yeah, I've been really kind of focusing on the past few years, like writing about kind of black British music, black British music history as well, and how the two um, are linked to black British identity and being. But for me, like, I always just loved like, listening to that kind of rock music, particularly like kind of from like the 60s and 70s. My dad was like a really big Jimi Hendrix fan. My dad is, I guess, one of those quite unusual Nigerians that's a rocker. <laughs> um, so, but I actually didn't, I wasn't a fan growing up. That was really like my dad's weird music. And it was only when I was a lot older and I got into guitar music myself that I kind of rediscovered Jimi Hendrix. But I think it was like, I think he was in my DNA from that early childhood immersion. So we're just at the start of our tour now and we're going to kick it off by talking to a few people. Let's go. The Handel and Hendrix Museum is free entry with the National Art Pass. Quite a narrow little doorway and entrance hall. It's quite, quite dimly lit. And quite wonky as well. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. It is definitely wonky and quite creaky. It's really atmospheric and pretty old, yes. Hello. And there are some people in 18th century costume also in the halls with us. <laughs> We've entered in through, yeah, Handel's, Handel's part of the house. So, oh, super creaky floorboards. Um, there's a harpsichord, lots of oil paintings. I could definitely see myself living here. <laughs> but no, it's... Um... I can see why kind of this house would have brought out a lot of creativity in both Handel and Hendrix. Just stepping inside the house of like two great musicians, um, it, it allows you to appreciate the music more because this is where they kind of would have created some of their best work. And yeah, it's just it's a really great experience to be here. with Handel's Messiah um, I remember like going to school like I'm from Dublin and it being like I remember it like it, it being a big deal that Handel's Messiah was first premiered in in Dublin and that it didn't it only opened in London a year later we are in very different surroundings there are huge oil paintings and big go gilt golden frames Oh, and then there's, a, there's an open fireplace with a clothes horse and some linens hanging out to dry. Oh my gosh, this bedroom is, wow. <laughs> um, big four poster bed with a huge canopy. I actually really like it. I love the space that he would have had in here. The bed itself, I think really kind of brings them to life. Yeah, I just love the red tapestry, the fireplace as well, and the big bust over over there on in the corner. You think you could adjust living here? Yeah, I could, I could actually. Uh, I'd obviously put some like plants in here, maybe some more modern kind of uh, portraits and paintings, but yeah, I, I definitely could. I'd love to have a bed like that. I don't think I'll ever have one in my lifetime. <laughs> quite narrow it's like it's, it's it's a big it's an impressive bed but it's quite narrow so it makes me even though it's kind of a double bed but they're just yeah. very tiny the bed is kind of noticeably shorter than a modern bed because apparently it was to part of culture in the 18th century that they were advised to sleep sitting up because it ah. would aid digestion 
So yeah, you can notice that it's, it's much shorter than a, a modern bed because Handel would have slept sitting up. Because which is kind of it lying down, yeah. You just assume that that's something that's existed with historic continuity yeah. so that's wow and that, when I think about paintings actually from that period you do often see people in bed sitting up yeah, yeah. but I just assumed that was because they were about to lie down. <laughs> um, hi so I'm Sean Doherty I'm the marketing manager here at Handel and Hendricks in London. So is this is this room recreated as it would have been in his time would he have had these oil paintings these marble busts and stuff it, se it seems quite extravagant. Yeah, so as much as possible, it has been recreated to be as it was when Handel lived here. So it's kind of a lot of his life is a bit of a mystery. He didn't leave any diaries or, um, you know, there's not much to go on in terms of evidence. But there was an inventory taken after he died. So everything that you can see in here has kind of been based off an item from that inventory, oh. including, yeah, I think he had, you know, up to 50 paintings of this size in his collection. He was a huge art collector. So, yeah, some of these paintings we know he would have, like, had work by these very artists. So, yeah, well, that it is quite is an incredible resource. Was he married? Did he have children? He was never married, never had any children that we know of, and there's a lot of kind of speculation about that. So, again, it's just one of these huge mysteries that I don't think we'll ever know the real answer to, but there are many, many hypotheses. So this yeah. was a bachelor pad rather than a family home? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so we realised that we know a lot more about Jimi Hendrix <laughs> than Handel. Um, if you could help us fill in some of the gaps, that would be great. Um, tell us a little bit more about why and when he came to London. Yeah, absolutely. So he was German from Halle and he had a connection with the um, Hanoverians, the, the royal family of Hanover who he kind of worked with and had the, was kind of a patron of. And they, of course, became the royal family of Britain with the Hanoverian succession. So when George I came over from Germany and became the king of Great Britain, he kind of brought Handel with him as his favourite musician. And then Handel continues that royal connection throughout his, throughout his life. So one of the first pieces he composes is the water music, which was for... King George I and was actually performed on a boat on the Thames with the king on the boat going up and down the Thames kind of promoting the fact that he'd come to Britain to become the king. So he, he had a very privileged position in society. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he, he was privileged, but in those times you had to take kind of a wage or a, a monthly or yearly amount of money. Um, and you'd quite often have to live in the grand houses of the royal family or dukes or lords um, or what have you. So yes and no. So Handel's actually a really interesting figure because he was able, he's one of the first musicians or artists to be able to own his own property and live in it. Um, because before that, musicians, artists, anyone who is kind of a creative person would have to live in the house of their patrons. Oh, so yeah. they're really vulnerable in a way to the, to the whims of their patrons and their creative output is kind of limited. Yeah. To... And there are lots of stories of, of creative people not really making it or, you know, falling out of favour with the people and then, you know, falling on hard times. But Handel never had that because he was kind of fiercely independent as well. The ground floor was um, actually a shop that he would sell his sheet music. So he was a kind of businessman as well and was able to become, you know, fiercely independent. How easy was it for Handel to adapt to British life at the time? Good question. I don't think we know too much about that, but we do know that Handel's one of the first people to become a British citizen. So it was, ever. yeah, ever. So there's actually an act of parliament called the Handel Naturalization Act, um, which is effectively, you know, he was one of the first people to be given British citizenship. It, before that, it didn't really exist. And I think the reason behind that was because he, he, he needed to be the teacher to the princesses of the royal family. And there was some sort of archaic law that said that you have to be British to teach the royals. Even if the royals were German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Work that one out.
London in particular is such an interesting place because it's always been a space that attracts people from all over the world, people who are fleeing something, people who are looking for better opportunities, people who are maybe outcasts where they come from. It really attracts a whole diverse diverse types of people and the culture of London has always been informed by immigrants and by people coming here from from all over the world. It's interesting that Handel, who was so closely related to these British institutions like the royal family, is himself an immigrant and I think that speaks really deeply to the fact that so much of what is perceived as British tradition has its origins from Europe and and beyond. So even things that are unkind of problematically seen as as English or British often have their antecedents or the creators of those things who are from other other parts of Europe and other parts of the world. And I think that's a really important thing to remember to kind of counter a lot of the narratives that we are being assaulted with at this moment in time and there's very this very kind of small island mentality that this has always been kind of like a closed and insular place so remembering that that, that's actually very ahistorical so we're looking at um a little desk that has a glass case and contained within is a notebook with some very beautiful but potentially for me unintelligible script and a quill. So yeah this is actually Handel's handwriting so this is a letter an actual letter that Handel wrote um, I believe in 1744 yeah July 1744 um, so you can see George Friedrich Handel that's his signature there um, and what he's doing in this letter is writing to Charles Jennings, who's that man in that portrait behind you. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wrote the words to Messiah. So he, was the, he wrote the libretto to Messiah. And this is Handel writing to Jennings. He's already received some of the words, but not all of them. And he's just saying, please send more. I've got so many great ideas. There's so much music flowing out of me. Please send more words so I can carry on writing. Um, because Handel wrote Messiah, which is something like seven or eight hours of music in 24 days. So he just, I don't think he slept, he just was writing constantly. In this room that we just walked into, we've got three musicians, one playing the uh, harpsichord, the cello, and then a violin as well. So my violin was made in 1842 over in Oxford Street by a man called Thomas Kennedy. And it's actually a viola da gamba. So you might have known. What are you guys playing? What are you doing? Uh, We're rehearsing some Erin Labach, um, who's a composer that came before Handel. Uh, We're just rehearsing for a concert that we have in September. So are you guys based at the museum or why, why is it that you rehearse here? So all of us have taken part in the Handel and Hendrix talent scheme over the past couple of years. I'm doing it this year, Kate last year and Satoko the year before last. So we like to use the museum as a base so we can interact with our audiences and of course the team here. That's such a wonderful resource. It's very, very useful. So I am sitting down at a double manual harpsichord. I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't just just read it. And it's from 1754. It was made by Jacob Kirkman, who is one of the most famous um, harpsichord and instrument makers of the time. And yeah, we know it's from the 18th century. We know it's from um, London at the time that Handel lived here. And interestingly, there's a note of a neighbour of Handel's buying an instrument by Jacob Kirkman and getting Handel to 
come to her house to use it to kind of check that it was quality and that it was you know a great instrument so she would kind of invite the local composer to try it and kind of give it his seal of approval so while we know this wasn't actually Handel's harpsichord it is from London when he was living here so it is within the realm of possibility that Handel played this very harpsichord which is kind of incredible. Wow Handel's harpsichord <laughs> what a day. All I know on the piano is like the opening of the ragtime song, The Entertainer. Like, and I'm really like, duh, 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 like really bad. I don't play any instrument. Hang on, let's try that one again. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> I shouldn't have done it, I feel deeply ashamed. <laughs> Hi, Emma and Jesse. Uh, my name is Joanna Roche, and I am the front of house and learning officer here at Handel and Hendrix. Joanna, what's this room that we're about to move into? I can hear guitar strains and see lots on the walls. Yeah, so this room is now um, used as um, Jimi Hendrix exhibition space, but it used to be Handel's attic. So we're standing right in the separation between where uh, the Hendrix building would have been 23 Brook Street and 25 Brook Street. Oh, wow, yeah. So there's the remnants of um, a very tiny looking and narrow staircase. It looks like a little hobbit staircase. And where does that lead to? So upstairs he would have had, um, you know, a little kitchen, a little bathroom and another room. When Jimi Hendrix lived here? Yeah, okay. exactly. And a small room that used to be used by George Harrison from time to time after. <laughs> yeah, of course, which is now called the George Harrison room. So other people lived downstairs, did they? So what was really convenient is that he didn't have any neighbours. It was offices around. So obviously, you know, that was really perfect for them, allowing them to make as much noise as they wanted to. Because I think Kathy and Jimmy tried to, you know, lease other flats around. And a lot of the landlords just said no, because, you know, they, can, they could foresee a bit of trouble. So, yeah, it was just perfect that it was offices, you know, with no one in the evening or nights. I think I read somewhere that he lived in, was it George Harrison or Ringo Starr? Ringo Starr's, yeah. Flat for a while, but he, Ringo had to ask them to to move on. Yeah, exactly. I think that repetition kind of stick to them. Um, yeah, it was in Montague Square before he actually, you know, decided he wanted to live here. He was crashing from uh, place to place and that was one of the main ones. Um, and yeah, they had a bit of trouble so they had to be, um, you know, gently asked to, to leave the <laughs> and not come back. <laughs> I can hear the, de definitely hear the strings of uh, Jimmy from back in the day. Um, but also just a sense of what the area was like at the time. You sometimes see some of imagery of like what it was like um, in the 60s in Soho and just and Mayfair as well. But I love this blazer that he's that's on display here. Um, it's a dandy fashions double vested jacket, and I just love the floral print of it. It's fitted, tailored. It's a a golden green silk with richly embroidered pink and golden flowers. It's got kind of like, um, yeah, it's got, it's got kind of like a, a classical romantic energy to it. Maybe that's Handel's, Handel's influence. I think, I think it just really brings his character to life and who he was. There weren't many black men with that kind of, that kind of platform. They were in the public eye in that way that presented in the way he did. And he really represents, like he's, he's such a, he's such a, forerunner, I think, of a lot of these conversations that we have today about b black masculinity and about kind of expanding notions of black masculinity. Like, he has quite a queer energy. There's quite, like, a femininity to him. He's just wearing, like, like silk kimonos. He's got this, like, huge afro hair at a time where most black American men would be far more far more clean cut and even if they did have afros you know these are very like precise like neat like well manicured afros so he's really representing um kind of yeah an alternative way of being black and black audiences often didn't respond very well to that presentation
Yeah, so we're entering into the room in the museum that's been recreated to look as it would have in Jimmy's time. And it's very intimate because it's his bedroom. And I believe it's been reconstructed from photographs and images of the time, um, full of feathers and tassels and quite Indian kind of ethnic hippie 1960s looking bits and pieces. His bed's very low. <laughs> I think the first thing that really st stuck out to me was the piece of paper by the bed on the bedside table and the tape recorder as well. I can imagine as soon as he woke up or just before he went to sleep, he would have jotted down some notes or even just recorded something, whether it's just like some, some lyrics that he was going to perform or whether it's just conversations. And yeah, so there would have been moments where it would have just been him and Kathy, his girlfriend at the time in the room. And it's those small intimate moments that we often take for granted as music fans, like they're, they're people at the end of the day. They often have the same rituals that we have as well. So I'm just looking at what looks like some lyrics that he wrote down. So I'm just going to read a couple of lines. Well, I float in liquid gardens in Arizona's new red sands. I taste the honey from a flower, blue in California, and New York drones as we held hands. Well, I stand up next to a mountain and I chop it down with the edge of my hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, so that was uh, lyrics from what song was that again? Voodoo Child, yeah, Slight Voodoo Child. Return, yeah. And I, I think the way um, the paper is next to his next to his bed, it makes me think that like maybe his lyrics came to him, you know, in dreams. So he's like turning around and like writing stuff that he's thought of while he's asleep or that he's dreamt. And it's got that kind of otherworldly dimension. That looks like a fire hazard. <laughs> that, that scarf over the bulb. Yeah. And there's so many cigarettes. It's truly yeah. so many cigarette butts. Truly a a, di a different time. Yeah, I just love the fireplace as well, the TV, everything that makes a home a home, essentially. I find the fireplace slightly triggering. It reminds me of, like, 80s Dublin and, like, not having central heating and that being, like, the sole... Something like that being the sole source of um, of heat and getting, like, chill blains from sitting, from sitting up too close to it. So I can imagine it actually being quite cold in here. Um, the mirror, obviously, is... Um important to point out because that's um, original that was here oh in, in the bedroom that was donated by his girlfriend Kathy. Unfortunately after they moved out everything was kind of given away. She didn't she couldn't keep all of the stuff so she you know sold stuff give it away but that was one that she kept so yeah, we're very happy to to keep that and out of all the items to have a mirror as an original is quite yeah. significant there's something quite magical about yeah, that yeah. seeing your reflection in something yeah. that he would have seen his reflection yeah, in exactly so that's really exciting so yeah i think the mirror is would definitely be my favorite um item in the bedroom it's not very rock and roll. Um, I'm looking at a kind of like a, a child-sized, apparently it's a dog, um, but it could be a, a fox. It definitely looks like some sort of like canine -y type animal. Um, it's, it's quite British. Um, it's wearing like a knitted woolen jumper, um, some shorts, little booties, has arms and legs, although it's a dog. It's kind of, yeah, kind of a child dog bear thing. Dog Bear. Do so his name, is, <laughs> his name is Dog Bear, um, and he was given by a fan after a concert, and for some reason he got very attached to it and kind of, you know, kept it when he moved houses after here, kind of travelled around with him. So, yeah, he just found that really, um, he really liked it. Oh, I find that quite touching yeah, and kind yeah, of sad. It, it kind yeah. of reminds you, like, of how young he was, in a way. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. It's, um, yeah, for some reason he just really liked it and... Yeah, kept it from place to place. Oh, I knew he was a gentle soul. Yeah, yeah it, so it sounds as though that he had, I guess, quite a close relationship with his fans, although he didn't know each of them personally. But to receive a gift like that off a fan and to take it around with you wherever you went just shows how much he valued his fans as well. Mm. Mm. And Yeah, that's very true. And he did, um, you know, not necessarily see them as fans. Whenever he spoke to people on the street or during gigs and they asked for his number, he would always just give his number out. You know, he was very friendly in that way. And the phone was constantly ringing in the flat, like constant people just, you know, ringing Jimmy. Um, so that's why if you look on the floor there, there's two phones uh, because Kathy decided that enough was enough and they needed a new phone with a new telephone number to, you know, kind of filter the phone calls. And apparently the same thing happened and he just 
you know, gave it again to everyone. So I think, yeah, it definitely you didn't necessarily see them as fans. You were kind of really close to them, which is really nice. I, Jesse's getting stuck in. Uh, I can see the crate digger coming out. And he's going through the records. What caught my eye in particular was the Indian artists here. And you can hear some of the Indian influence in his music as well. So, yeah, it's just fascinating. Like, whatever he collected, whatever music he collected, you can hear elements of it in his music. And it just kind of just goes to show the power of music and how infectious it is like you can just hear one line or one note or even a whole song and just incorporate that into your own artistry and it just kind of goes to show the wide range of um, Jimi Hendrix as well like he could have made any type of music in the world if he really wanted to he just didn't get the chance to and it's yeah, yeah. I find it fascinating. I, yeah I, I think amongst all the things that are so tragic about him dying so young is what he would have gone on to do musically. Like, I'd love to see the influence that he would have had on hip hop. I'd imagine him being like a hip hop producer at some point mm. in his life, a Quincy Jones type figure that just had his hand in um, so many different genres of music that were to develop over the next decades. Uh, you know, when the audience is quiet while you're playing, that's really great. That means we're listening. It's like we're on campus. One of the things that kind of really drew me to Jimi Hendrix before I even started listening to his music was his stage presence. It was like it was like a spiritual ritual or, some, or something like that when he was on stage. And one of the things I've always kind of admired, particularly about kind of black artists of that time, is how when they were on stage, it was like they were leading a sermon of some sorts, a ritual mm -hmm. of some sorts. They were the pastor, they were the preacher. The mic was their, was their Bible of sorts. I just really find it fascinating how whenever you saw Jimmy play, it was as though he was being taken to another world himself. And you could see it in the audience. They were kind of taken to a completely different plane, to a completely different dimension. And I think, I think that kind of energy still lives within music. Like one of his other kind of descendants, I guess his sonical descendants, uh, two of them actually, A Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul, which most people wouldn't, normally associate with Jimi Hendrix. It's, completely, it's a completely different style of music as well, but I guess the philosophy behind their artistry, like De La Soul have a lot of kind of imagery where they've got like the peace symbols. So you can draw comparisons to there. And I think whether they're aware of it or not, you can see how an artist from before can live on through them. And I think from when you look at it like that, you get a sense that an artist can never really die in that way. If you look at it from a kind of spiritual and kind of theological aspect. Can an artist really die if their music lives on through someone else? This place does, does the job like so spectacularly to encompass musicians who are kind of so far apart on the spectrum as Hendrix and Handel, but to be able to do such great justice to both of them and to really whet your appetite to, to, to know more about both of them because you would imagine that they're both, Handel and Hendrix, are appealing to quite different audiences. But um, I think that even if you came here because your interest was in Hendrix, you couldn't leave, I don't think, without having an awakened interest in Handel. And I think equally, if you had come to see Handel, you'd also be compelled and like mesmerized by what you'd learned about Hendrix. I was completely enamored with it. Like it, it's really enlightening just seeing the lives and the homes of two very different artists brought to life. And I'd love to see more spaces like this being created, particularly in, in the UK, like particularly from a like grime aspect as well. Um, I'd love to see in 20, 30 years time, like Kano and Stormzy's houses being kind of preserved in some really fascinating way because they are the cultural innovators of our time. But you get a sense that gentrification is actually erasing so much cultural history, not just removing people from their homes and, mo and moving them to other areas, but it's removing the fabric of that area, the cultural history and the, and the DNA of that area. And I think the government should do more to preserve some of these spaces and some of these homes because they are what we are gonna look back in the future 
in a way, they are, our, they are our future. And if we don't preserve them, then that future is kind of erased in some ways. There's this sense that museums are often, um, you know, places that are kind of like frozen in time and they're kind of out of touch, as it were. But this is very much like a living museum because you have contemporary musicians who are on programmes here and who are playing instruments and rehearsing and doing performances and really drawing on all of that inspiration that exists here. And it's an incredible resource for musicians and audiences alike. And I wasn't paid to say that. <laughs> Hashtag ad. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Meet Me at the Museum with me, Emma Davery and Jesse Bernard. If you like this episode of the podcast, please rate, subscribe or tell a friend. Don't forget, if you've got a National Art Pass, you can get free entry or discounts on museums all around the country, including this one. Music